your tender mercies, your loving kindness. Thank you for knowing us and yet still loving us. Knowing all of our ups and downs, our faults and our failures. But we thank you, Lord, even though you know them all, you continue to look beyond our fault. And you continue to meet us at the place of our need. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thought we needed a new house, but we got a new house and our lives were still a mess. We thought we needed a new car. We thought we needed new friends. We thought we needed a new job. But we have discovered our only need is the need for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the great payment he paid for our lives. His sacrifice on the cross, the atonement for our sins. Oh, how it is paid, paid in full. Thank you for Jesus. As he was deposited in, in that grave only to get up again on Sunday morning. Thank you for Jesus. As he ascended unto heaven to sit on the right hand side, the seat of authority, we know he's coming back again. Thank you for Jesus. He said these words that where I am, there ye may be also. We look forward, Lord, to spending our eternal days, moments with Jesus. But until that time, Lord, you told us to occupy until you came back. We have an occupation, we have a job, we have a calling. We have a purpose in this life. Thank you, oh God. You've made some of us preachers. You've made some of us teachers. You've made some of us helpers. You've made some of us servants and singers. You've made us so many things. And Lord, help us to live out our purpose to your glory and to your honor. Lord, as we have worshipped you with scripture and with prayer, as we have worshipped you, oh God, in song and in fellowship, now we worship you with our ears. Give us ears to hear your word hands and feet to live them out. We pray always in the name of our Lord Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody help me give God praise today. Amen. We have a mission statement that we share in. Let's do that by the power of the Spirit of God through the preaching and teaching of the gospel message. We populate heaven. Amen. Teach people. Somebody say amen. I want to visit Psalm, the 30th number of the Psalm. It is proper to say number and not chapter. Why? Because the book of Psalms is a song book. Somebody say a song book. And if it's a song book, it is divided by numbers. And so we're going to look at the 30th number of the Psalm. Amen. We're going to begin reading at verse number one and we'll conclude at verse number five. Verse number five is probably in this psalm the most noted verse, um, but we will read verses one, two, three, four, and then we will conclude with verse number five. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you sure look good. And they're going to get arrogant for a minute, so you don't look as good as me, though. Say, so keep on trying, keep on trying. What did mama say? If at first you don't succeed. <laughs> Amen. God is good. Very good. Well, here it is. Let me read even the superscription of this text. Some of you may not have this in your Bible. Uh, it is, uh, as the songwriter would do, a title somewhat or at least uh, some description or occasion of the text. Uh, if you don't have it, I'll read it for you. It says a psalm. Before you get to verse one, it says a psalm. A song at the dedication of the house of David. And then it says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you, somebody say, healed me. You healed me, you healed me, you healed me. Oh God, oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. And then David looks around at the people around him as he writes this song thinking about them. He says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. Why? For his anger is but for a moment. His favor 
is for life. Weeping may endure for a night. Somebody say, but joy. But joy. <laughs> come, come on, help me shout real quick. But joy comes in the morning. Amen. You may take your seats. I want to tag this text simply with this topic today. That's why I praise him. That's why I praise him. Say that after me. That's why I praise him. If you dare include somebody else, say that's why we praise him. The Old Testament scholar and theologian by the name of Walter Brueggemann, he has developed a very intriguing way of categorizing the book of Psalms and bringing them into our own personal lives. Brueggemann in his book entitled Praying Through the Psalms, he has a book entitled Praying Through the Psalms, he suggests that the Psalms reflect two very basic movements in everyone's life. The first movement, the first movement, it, it, is, it is the move into the pit. Somebody say the pit. It's the move into the pit. It happens when our world collapses around us and we feel that there is no way out of the deep hole into which we have sunk. That's, that's the first. That's the first move. It's the move into the pit. The second move is the move out of the pit. Somebody say out of the pit. It's the move out of the pit into a welcome place. We suddenly understand what has happened and who has brought us up out of the pit. And see, Brueggemann further suggests that human beings regularly find themselves in one of three places. Sight and sound, if you have this, put that up there. In one of three places. Number one, number one, the place of, somebody say, orientation. It's the place of orientation. What does that mean? Orientation. What does that mean? Get that in your mind. If you're making notes, write that down. Orientation. Orientation is the place in which everything makes sense in our lives. In other words, things are going well. Things are going good. We feel pretty good about ourselves. Our health is all right. The job is all right. Our money. Somebody say, our money is all right. Our money is all right. That, 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 that boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife, they acting all right. Somebody say, man, that's orientation. Then secondly, secondly, we move sometimes in life, in life from orientation to, somebody say, disorientation. To disorientation, a place of disorientation. What is that? Disorientation is that place in which we feel we have sunk down into a pit. When you read the Psalms, you will find David speaking of being in tight places, being in deep, dark dungeons, being in pits. It's a place of disorientation. We've sunk down into a pit. Our world has, is falling apart, and we don't know how we can work it out, and how we're going to make it, how we're going to make it through. That's the time when we, when we want to quit. We want to throw in the towel. Well, that's, that's disorientation. But here's the part you ought to shout about. Somebody say reorientation. Well, it's, it's reorientation. Some people call it new orientation. You go from orientation to disorientation now to re or new orientation. That's the place in which we realize that God has lifted us out of the pit and we are in a new place full of gratitude and awareness about our lives and about our God. See, using, using these three places, Brueggemann suggests that life has a rhythm. Somebody say a rhythm. As we move from one place to the next, he believes that uh, that psalm, they match uh, us and that these different places that, that they show how our life goes through places of pain and pleasure. We find such movements in the psalm that we look at today, psalm number 30. And we can tell by this psalm, we can tell by this psalm, even by, at the beginning of this psalm, uh, even by reading the sub or superscription of this psalm, that David is in the orientation phase of his life. The superscription of the psalm tells us that this psalm was written at the dedication of the house of David. Now, we're not sure which house the text is speaking of. It could have been speaking of David's personal house, his palace. When David... 
uh, if you will, established the capital for Israel to be in Jerusalem and had built himself a house, a palace there, established himself as king there. That was a joyous time. And maybe the psalm was written around that time or around that theme of him, the dedication of his personal house. But others believe and most believe that it was not David's house, but it was the Lord's house. That's a tricky thing because David in, uh, of himself did not build the house. David uh, bought the land for the house. David gathered the materials for the house. But David's son Solomon built the house. But nonetheless, some believe it was at the dedication or the start of those things that this psalm was written. So it was a good time and a good place in David's life when he wrote this psalm. He's in the orientation of life. Things are going well. He begins this psalm. He begins the psalm. He begins the psalm uh, with uh, what I call his individual remembrance. Somebody say individual remembrance. Every now and then, you ought to just take a, a moment of time to look back. Now, 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 not to look back, to go back, but to look back and thank God for, oh, come on now, from where he's brought you from. Uh, every now and then it's good to just pause a moment and look back over your life. Some of y'all ought to be praising God because a few years ago you wouldn't have been here at 8 o'clock in the morning giving God praise. A few years ago you would still be in a drunken stupor. Y'all ain't getting what I'm saying today. David, David, David looks back. He, he does an individual remembrance of what God has done for him. Listen to what he says. He says, I will bestow you, O Lord. Etymologically speaking, that word extol simply means I will eulogize you. That's a, a funny word we don't use usually outside of the context of a death, a funeral, a homegoing service. But it, it can be used outside of that context. It simply means I will say good things about you. Now, here's what I've noticed about eulogizing human beings. It's, it's kind of one-sided because you ever been to one of them funerals? And you hear everybody get up one after the other talking about the person that's dead laid before us. And, and you, have to, you got to look at the program to figure out if you at the right funeral or not. <laughs> Somebody said we tend to be one-sided at a funeral, don't we? We tend to only, you know, you know, publicly talk about the good stuff. Publicly talk about how good he or she was and what they did. And you sitting there like, mm-hmm, they will still owe me some money, though. Who, who they talking about? You, you, you looking at the program like, who, am I in the right place? Well, aren't you glad that when you eulogize God and talk about the goodness of God, there is no other side to that. God is just good because God is God. And you ought to know it by your experience because you know God has been good to you. David says, I will extol you, O Lord. I will eulogize you. And he gives three reasons why he would uh, he was speaking about the goodness of God. The first thing he says, I will stole you, O Lord, for you have, somebody say, lifted me up. David is speaking of a time, obviously, again, he's in orientation. He's looking back. He's not down anymore. He's up now, but he, he thanks God because he remembers who was the one that lifted him up. David was at one time in a pit. He was in a dark place. He was in a dungeon. And now he says, I will praise you. I will eulogize you because you have lifted me up. Another reason, another reason David says that, that he will, he will, he will uh, speak good about God. In that same verse, he says, and you have not allowed my foes to rejoice over me. Anybody in here have a trip? Okay, let me ask, let me ask you. Okay. Anybody here, in here have a trip? No, I'm literally talking about tripping maybe over your own feet. Now, it's one thing to trip. It's another thing for folk to see you trip. Y'all ain't getting it, are you? You ever trip and then look around and see who looking? See, because you're really you're really not concerned about tripping so much as you're concerned about the embarrassment of tripping. It's one thing to trip. Another thing to to see who looking at you when you trip. But it's another thing when your enemies watch you trip. No. Somebody, 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 somebody. Now you, you, you can kind of, you kind of handle it better when your friends see your trip because you're, you're gonna make light of it, you're gonna make a joke about it. But when your enemies see your trip, they start rejoicing. Your friends laugh with you, but your enemies laugh at you. Somebody gonna get this? 
And let me tell you how life is sometimes. I don't care who you are, don't care how long you've been in the church, in God, in the Word of God, you're going to have some times when you're going to trip. Matter of fact, you're going to have some times when you're going to slip. You're going to have some times when you fall. And David is speaking of a time and past when he had slipped, tripped, and fell into a pit. And God had lifted him up. And he thanks God for that. But he also thanks God that he did not allow his enemies. Y'all ain't getting this. He did not allow his foes. He did not allow his adversaries to rejoice over him. In other words, God let him slip, trip, and fall. But he covered him. That's what a real friend will do for you. A real friend can know your stuff but won't tell nobody. A real friend can know your fault but won't put it on Instagram. Talk to me and Facebook and Twitter. Y'all ain't getting what I'm saying. A real friend can know your real issues but they won't tell nobody. And you know why? Because God put them in your life. Tell somebody love covers a what? Multitude of sin. If you got a real friend, a real friend will know your dirt but they'll sweep around you sometimes. A real, come on talk to me, a real friend will know your down but nobody else would know it. A real friend when other folk are talking about you won't let other folk say your name like that two sons of Noah got in trouble because they saw the slip trip and fall of their father after Noah you remember the the Noah thing and the boat you know the ark and all of that and after they got off the ark Noah had you know like some of y'all do head down there a little too much wine and Noah in his tent he got drunk and the younger son of Noah came in, saw his father's nakedness. You got to understand, I wish I had time to talk about nakedness. This has another sermon, how, how, how God wants us to cover up. Somebody say, cover up. Oh, it's summertime right now. Somebody say, look at your neighbor and say, cover up. Well, 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 well. Noah was naked. Younger son saw him. And here's what the younger son did. He went and told the other brothers. When they came in, they were so respectful that they did not even look at the nakedness of their father. They grabbed, if you will, a sheet of robe and they walked backwards into the tent to cover up their father. Y'all, that's what friends will do for you. Uh, you. You can be exposed, but they won't even look at you. Oh, come on, talk to me, somebody. They will cover you. And that's what God did for David. He would not allow his enemies to rejoice over his folly. So he praises God because God had lifted him up. He praises God because God didn't allow his foes to rejoice over him. And then he praises God, number three, because God had healed him. Somebody say healed him. Look at verse two. Look at verse two. David says, oh Lord my God, I cried out to you. He was in anguish. He, he prayed, but he cried out. And he says, you healed me. Oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. See, now watch this. Now, now, now David just wasn't going through the chicken pox or the measles or the mumps or shingles. He had a deep sickness. His sickness could have easily led to death. That's why David said, you brought me up out of the grave. In other words, David was so sick, some, some doctors had walked away and shook their heads and said, we can't do nothing about this. He said, you brought me out of the grave. You, you've kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Now remember, as he's talking about being in a pit, as he's talking about being down and God lifting him up, as he talks about God not letting his foes rejoice over him, as he talked about God healing him, he's talking about this in past because where he is now, he is in orientation. Somebody say orientation. Things are good. But he's thanking God for how things are good. And he looks back and he thanks God for what he has done. But he moves now, watch this. He moves from, if you will, his individual remembrance to his public reminders to the people. David, David in verse 4, begins to look at the people and say, sing praises to the Lord. Now David's the one testifying here. But as he's testifying, I can imagine, let, let's, let's, let's think about David being in a worship setting and, and David notices that he the only one standing up. He notices he the only one got his hands up. Come on now. He the only one saying praise God. You ever been there? <laughs> he, 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 he the only one clapping his hands. He, he the only one getting his dance on. And David begins to look around and I believe he's thinking this now. Now the God that I serve that has been good to me, certainly I ain't the only one he's been good to. 
Well, why y'all, why y'all looking at that person praising God, talking about what's wrong with them? It, it don't take all of that. They, they ought to be looking at you and say, what's wrong with you? It does take all of this and more. Somebody ought to hear me praise, hear me, hear me, hear me now. When we praise God, sometimes it ought not be just one. See now, you can praise God individually during the week on your own time by yourself. But when you get in the house, anybody remember going to house parties? Well, y'all playing with me today. You Ninevites know you didn't been to some parties. Anybody remember going to house parties? Anybody remember going to the club? Come on, talk to me, somebody. And, and sometimes we just needed somebody to get it started. We go in, the, the DJ be doing his thing, the music is going, folk just standing on the wall. But do, do I have some folk that knew how to get on the flow? Come on now. You y'all remember that song, No Parking Baby? No parking on the dance floor? Beep, beep. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying today. Hey, we need somebody to get it started. Well, I need somebody right now to stand with me and get it started in here and give God some praise and give God worship and lift your hands and open your mouth and say thank you. Hey, can we just take a moment to think about the goodness of God, to think about where you were and where he's brought you from and what he's doing for you right now. God is a good God. He's wonderful. He's excellent. He is our God. All right, y'all sit down. Let me get done with the sermon. Listen. Uh, he, he, if you're at home, just touch the TV or something. Touch the computer screen. I don't. His, his, his public reminders to the people, he reminds them that God has blessed them too. Amen. Isn't it good to know, you know, that God ain't just blessing you? I don't know about you. I'm not, good folk like to share good things. Hey Amen. If you got a deal on something, don't you tell other folk, hey, I got a good deal on this. If you've been blessed and enriched in an area, you don't you tell other folk about that. Well, David's doing the same thing. He says, now, sing praises to the Lord, you saints of his. I wish I had time to, to, to unpack that. He says, give thanks at the remembrance of his name. He's, he's publicly reminding them now to praise God. Now it's getting ready to shift. It's getting ready to shift. Watch it now. It's going to be a subtle shift, but it's going to shift. He says, sing praises to God. Somebody say sing. How many of y'all think y'all can sing? How many of y'all know y'all can sing? How many of y'all know you can't sing? Well, when David is challenging the people to sing here, this is not choral singing. This is not singing that you rehearse. This is not choir rehearsal. Y'all ain't getting this. This is not preparing to sing. This, this is singing that just breaks out. Y'all ain't getting this. This is eclectic singing. Y'all, y'all, this is abstract singing, if you will. This is just you at home stirring the pot singing. This is you on I-35, come on now, driving singing. This is you thinking about how good God has been. This is you just breaking out on song. This is amazing grace. How sweet the sound singing. This, this, this is can't nobody to me like Jesus singing. This is, I woke up this morning with my mind kind of. Anybody ever sing like that? If anybody else saw you and heard you, they'd be like, oh girl, them notes coming out your mouth. But it ain't, it, this song ain't for them anyway. It's for God. How many even know that God loves your singing, girlfriend? I don't care if you're soprano, alto, tenor, nothing. I don't care what it is. God is uh, basking in your praise. And David is saying, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his name. Now, this is where, where it turns. Because David is challenging them now to remember, watch this now, something about God in particular, to remember how holy he is. He says, give thanks at the remembrance of his holy Name. How many even know God's name is holy? Now, now this is where saints get in trouble. Because sometimes I hear somebody's phone going off. This is where saints get in trouble. When they let their phone go off in church. This is when saints <laughs> get in trouble. When the pastor looks over to the right and get ready to call somebody out. This is when saints, particularly my choir members, get in trouble. Somebody ought to help me. Uh, we forget about, and it fits, the holiness of God's 
name. There were just certain things we wouldn't do. We might have done them all week, but we wouldn't do them on Sunday. And even if we did them on Sunday, we wouldn't do it when we were driving up. Y'all remember you would be listening to, to Aretha Franklin, but when you pulled up, you put on Kirk Franklin? <laughs> somebody, 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 somebody. <laughs> and wife could, could have been fussing and cussing all the way from waking up in the morning, getting in the car but when they pulled up on the holy ground of the church oh come on, everybody straightened up good morning, how you doing? Why? Why? I mean you could have been cussing and fussing but you get a new language when you walk in here, how you doing? God bless you my brother, God has been, come on talk to me somebody, well even though that was fake, I honor that because it at least showed some reverence and respect don't get me wrong, cussing is cussing. Whether you do it at your house or this house. Amen. Hoeing is hoeing. Whether you do that at your house or this house. Fornicating is fornicating. Y'all get what I'm saying? The sin is the sin is the sin no matter where it is because we're fooled into thinking that God is only here. Now God is everywhere at the same time. But the point I'm making, at least if you can't do nothing else, have respect for the things of God. He's telling Israel, don't forget his name is holy. God spent, 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 spent time with Israel one time and he says, I am the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt out of the house of bondage and he goes to tell them and give them these ten commandments and one of those commandments is do not use my name in vain now many of us easily think it means don't use his name in a cussing cursing kind of fashion but it's beyond that it's beyond that some of, some of us use his name in vain when we lie on him Years ago, a female came to me, told me, God told me you were going to be my husband. She lying. <laughs> Some folk use the Lord's name, just do what they want to do. And they invoke his name to get you off of them. You love them, you know what they're doing is foolish. You know, they're headed down the wrong road. It ain't nothing biblical about where they're going and where they're headed. And you try to bring, you know, some sense into, into their life, some wisdom. God told me. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Even as your pastor, if you, you pull that one on me, I'm going to leave you alone. I try to help you. I'm going to try to counsel you. I'm try to steer you in the right direction. But you say, pastor, I don't know what you're saying. God told All right, God told you. I'm out. Amen. Because you could be telling the truth. More than likely you ain't. But, but. But, but the point is, sometimes we'll say, God told me, and we're just saying that so we can do. Y'all, I didn't see folk do stuff in the name of God, and it didn't work five minutes later. And then they got nervous, and well, God told me something different. What? The God you serve is crazy. He's up and down. Something wrong with him. He, he says, go this way, and two minutes later, he say, go that way. That's not how my God works. That's not how my, my God don't jerk me around like that. He gives me vision. He gives me direction. He's not bipolar. Matter depressing. Y'all getting what I'm saying? Sometimes we use his name in vain. Let me just give you a few, few moments of that and then we'll close the sermon down. One of the most dangerous things we do in this country, and again, I, I always challenge our country. I, I love our country. First of all, again, if you're here, and I want you to know where I am, where I, where, I, where I am with this country. I love America. I ain't going nowhere. Amen. A couple of years ago, y'all talking about going back to Africa. God bless you. Bring me a flag back. Give me a t-shirt. Amen. I'm staying right here. Now, having said that, as much as I love my country, I love my country enough to be honest about my country. Amen. And one of the things that, that's, that, really, that really strikes me where we are as a country now, talking about using the Lord's name in vain, how dare we, uh, police, these politicians and these ceremonies, they put their hand on a Bible. I mean, hell, stop doing that. Just, let's, just, let's just use the Constitution. Put your hand on the Constitution because we have more respect for the Constitution than we have the Scripture. So y'all get mad when I tell you the truth. Got the nerve to stand before God and people put your hand on his word and you legalize killing babies. Put your hand on his word and you legalize unarmed.
unauthorized marriages. Put your, oh, come on. Even put his name on our money, but yet the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. How dare we stand and put our hand on the name of God and do what we do. David says, don't forget his name is holy. And many of us have gotten in trouble because we have forgotten the holiness of God. Now, I know I say it jokingly. You know, you, you know you've been there. But again, let me say it real quick as I move on. <laughs> Do y'all remember again when, when it was storming outside and raining? Remember y'all didn't have parents like this. We had a little one TV. But you know what? It, it went off. You know why? Because God was doing his business, mama said. Amen. The lights went off. We got in one room. It was raining and storming and thundering and lightning outside. But, and we were quiet because God was working. I know some of y'all saying that's old school. That's old fogey. That's superstitious. It might have been. But it showed a respect. And, oh, come on. It showed a respect for God. Certain things you wouldn't say. Mama say, God going to strike you down. Now y'all like, let him come. Let him strike me down. See, we so arrogant now. Y'all, God is still God. And his name is holy. And when we forget the holiness of God, we act like we're acting now. We act a doggone fool. Somebody say, orientation. But because we forget about God's holiness, we move ourselves into, somebody say, disorientation. David, 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 as he is reminding the people about holiness and praising God. Verse 5 seems like it doesn't even fit. He says, for his anger is but for a moment. Here is the tie. Here is the synthesis here. Verse 4, he says, Israel, don't forget God's holiness. Verse 5, he says, God gets angry. Did y'all get that? Let me try it. Let me see if I got some smart folk over here. Verse four, he says, don't forget God's holiness. Verse five, he says, God gets angry. Oh, man, y'all, y'all playing with me. Don't forget God's holiness in verse four. Verse five, he says, God gets angry. One of the things God gets angry about is when we forget his holiness. And some of us have this new kind of God now that is so wimpish, sissified. He's so loving, kind, and merciful. And he is that. But he does get angry. You don't believe me? Ask Adam and Eve. Can I just teach a little bit? Ask Adam and Eve. When they listened to another voice over God's voice, God put them out their house. They got kicked out of paradise. Ask Noah. When folk kept acting a fool, the deluge of wickedness brought a deluge of water. And God destroyed all the creation except Adam and his family. Why? Because God got angry. Y'all ain't getting it. Okay, okay. Let, let, let me move on. Let me see. Ask Abraham. There were two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And when God finally got fed up with their evilness and wickedness, come on, y'all, he destroyed those cities. Ask Moses. When the people kept murmuring and complaining and complaining and murmuring, God opened up the earth swallow some of them Ninevites whole and close it back up never to be heard from again why because God gets angry but now some of us think oh that's the God of the Old Testament we in the church age now well the church age began in, in Acts chapter 2 when the church got started but do you not know there was a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira Negroes had the nerve 
to lie to the church. But see, let me tell you something. When you lie to the church, you ain't just lying to the church. You lying to God. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. First, the husband come in talking about this all the money me we made. We ain't make no more money than this. Take this. I, I mean, I'm, and the apostle like, come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. God struck him dead. Wife didn't know what happened. She came in. They had. They were in cahoots with the same lie. She came in talking about, yeah, my husband. Whatever he said, that's true. And so, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. I love my wife. I love my wife. I love my wife. We've been married 19 years, but I ain't about to be struck down for Joy Brown. If Joy. I'm be, I'm, be, I'm be like this. <laughs> Amen. We won, but I draw the line now. Sapphire came in, told the same lie, and what did the angry God do? Struck her dead. How many of you know God is still the same? Then my wife right there. I, I, she, she heard me. Somebody say amen. See, I ain't scared. I'll say it in her face. <laughs> I got security too. <laughs> Let me shut it down. Well, he talks about his anger. I'm going to tell you something. God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New Testament. See, we think God has changed. He hadn't changed just because he hadn't killed you yet. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, and, I, and this is the scary thing about me living in this country now. If God doesn't bring judgment upon America, he's got to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they ain't got nothing on us. We got instant porn. I can pull something up right now. Somebody ought to holler at me here. God gets angry. But as great as God can get angry, let me take you now into reorientation. Remember, orientation of things are well. Disorientation was things are going bad, and, and Israel had experienced the wrath of God many times because of their disobedience. But, but, but David begins the psalm by saying, I will extol you, I will praise you. How is it that David can talk about praise in the midst of talking about now about punishment? Because here's what David knows about God. He says, for his anger is but for a moment. Y'all making this sermon too hard. I got two more sermons to do. I got to say some energy. He says his anger is but for a moment. In other words, God gets angry, but he doesn't stay angry. <laughs> y'all, y'all missing it. His anger is but for a moment. I want to tell you something today that you ought to praise God that he doesn't stay mad at you. Amen. Amen. And God has every right. The, what the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. He told us that from the beginning. He has every right to kill us. He has every right to destroy us. He has every right to wipe us off the face of the earth. But you know why God doesn't do it? Because his anger doesn't last that long. And I'm glad I serve a God like that because I know some folk who still mad at me from the 80s. Anybody hearing me today? I got some folk can't stand me, couldn't stand me then, can't stand me now. But I'm glad my life is not in their hands. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad my future is not in their hands. I'm glad my destiny is not in their hands. But I'm glad that, that my life is in God's hands. Because even when he gets angry, his anger only lasts for a moment. Now I know this is hard to say because sometimes even though his anger only lasts for a moment, sometimes it feels like a lifetime. Because can't nobody spank you like God. Anybody in here ever been spanked by God, ever been chastened by God? Well, you in good company. He loves you. That's why he chastens you. But, oh, God knows how to do it, doesn't he? And David was one who knew about the chastening of God. He knew about the anger of God. He knew about the spanking of God. But David is excited in this new orientation and reorientation because he says his anger only lasts but a moment. Somebody in here ought to help me praise God because if God was still angry with you, you wouldn't be here right now. If God was still angry with us, come on, y'all, we wouldn't be in worship giving God praise right now. When you think about where you've been and where God has brought you, think about if you would still be there, what would happen? There's some folk that went to jail and you did the same thing and you're still here. 
There's some folk that died and you did some of the same things, but you are still here. But the only reason you are still here is because his anger is only for a moment. But then secondly, not only is anger for a moment, he says, because this is why his anger only lasts a little while, because in God's favor is life. Anybody know that God cares about your life? From the very beginning to the very end, you can trace in scripture that God cares about our life. There it is in the garden. If I can teach you again, in the garden with Adam and Eve, God told them they could eat of any tree that was in the garden. He told them of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat from it. But he says now, especially eat from this tree. It was called the tree of life. Tell somebody God's all about our life. And all Adam and Eve had to do was continue to eat from life. Well, when Adam and Eve messed up and sinned, because now they had sinned, had they eaten from the tree of life, after they sinned, they would have lived forever in their sin. So God put them out of the garden, the Bible says, just to protect the tree of life. Somebody got to get this. This is deep. This is deep. This is deep. But that tree of life appears another time in scripture on a hill called Calvary. This time that tree was not a budding tree. It was not a lively tree. It was a tree that was called a cross. And Jesus, come on y'all, got upon that tree that was dead. And what did he do? He died on that tree, y'all. And they put him in the grave. And early Sunday morning, Jesus got up with all power in his hands. That, that tree that was in the garden appears on Calvary. But later on in the book of Revelation, you see the same tree called the tree of life. I'm here to tell you that God cares about your life. His anger is but a moment, but in his favor is life. I heard Jesus say the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life, y'all ain't getting this, and have life more abundantly. Anybody here know that God cares about your life? Well, David ends this particular verse by saying, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. He says, even though, even, even, even though there is this tree of life and God cares about life, in this life you will have some difficulties. In this life you will have some hard times. In this life you will have trials and tribulations. In this life some of your friends will become your worst foes. He says, weeping may endure for a night. But aren't you glad even though God's anger has a shelf life, your sorrow also has a shelf life. Because he says joy will come in the morning. Well, when he says weeping may endure for a night, don't think about it in night that is measured in minutes and measured in moments. He's talking about a season of your life. Anybody ever been uh, in the nighttime season of your life? When you're in the nighttime season of your life, it might be midnight in the middle of the day because you're in the nighttime season of your life. Well, anybody know that God put in place seasons? And in the book of Genesis, he says, as long as we dwell on the earth, all of the seasons will continue to recycle winter, spring, summer, and fall. So in other words, if you're in the weeping season, if you're in the night season of your life, tell your neighbor, don't give up. Tell your neighbor, don't quit. Tell your neighbor, don't throw in the towel. You may be in the night season, but one of these old days, God will rotate your life and you will move from the night season into the morning season. Weeping may endure for a night, but I heard David say joy, joy, joy will come in the morning. Anybody know about the morning? Well, let me tell you something. Again, the morning 
is something like the night. When he's talking about the morning, he's not talking about the time early that's measured by minutes and moments. He's talking about a season in your life. Anybody here know it can be night and time for real, but for you it can be morning. I got this thing, saints. When I greet you sometimes, I will say good morning. I, I love how you try to correct me, Pastor. It's not morning, it's noon. It's it's afternoon, it's evening. Well, it may be afternoon and evening for you, but it's morning for me. Can I say good morning? I'm saying it here at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, but if it was 8 and 9 p.m., I'd still say good morning because when you have the joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world cannot take it away. Somebody say good morning. Good morning, friends. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy, joy comes in the morning. Anybody glad that you're in the morning? Let me close by telling you about this morning. Even though it's a season, when you cross over from the night into the morning, it begins to begin, it begins, it begins to stay the same season. I know you hear about seasons and how they change, but they change in the natural. How they change, they change in the physical. Y'all ain't getting this. How they change, they change in the flesh. But when you get in God, the season does not change. When you're in God, you're no longer in the natural. You're in the supernatural. When you're in God, you're no longer just in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. So when the morning comes, the morning never leaves. Don't you know when we get to heaven, every day is going to be Sunday. The Sabbath will have no end. The day and morning will always be. Night never comes in glory land. Even though I'm not physically in glory land, I am in glory right now because my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Is there anybody in here know you're in morning time of your life? Here's how you know you're in the morning. Here's how you know you got joy. I heard Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. In this life, you will have trials. In this life, you will have a tough time. But I heard him also say, be of good cheer. Because I've already overcome the world. Anybody know that God has overcome the world? He's overcome your trials. He's overcome your test. He's overcome your temptations. Hallelujah! Praise his name. I'm in the morning of life. Can I take it a little higher? Is there anybody in here? You got joy. I, I heard James say, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. In other words, no matter what's going on all around you, hell could be breaking loose. But I dare you, double dog dare you, to stand anyway. Lift your hands, open your mouth, and give God praise. Yeah! 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 Hallelujah! That's why I praise Him. Because weeping may endure for a night, but joy, 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 in the morning. I'm done preaching here. Is there anybody in this house that have the joy of the Lord? Is there anybody in this house that can give God praise? Is there anybody in this house that 
can worship him right now even when it's dark around you in your flesh it may be nighttime but in your spirit it's morning time if it's morning time you ought to give God praise give him praise give him praise hey hallelujah got my dance on this morning cause it's morning time got my praise on this morning cause it's morning time he's been too good to me has he done anything for you I'm trying to leave you I try to get out of here but I can't stop praising him I can't stop worshiping him even if the music stops I gotta give him praise even if the organ is still I gotta give him praise even if the drums don't beat him I gotta give him praise and even if you look at me like I'm crazy I gotta give him praise God has been too good to me his name today come on and bless his name Jesus. 